Uh, hi, my name is Mitch Kramer, and joining me is uh, Trey Talley for December's end of year webinar. We're going to be talking about what's going on in the economy, uh, what's impacting the markets, the you know the Fed speak, and what's going on with inflation. Um, and again, importantly, what we're doing about to protect your money. We're still remaining in a defensive position. I know a lot of people are kind of uh, were uh, just tired of this market and not having any significant recovery. And again, I think patience is going to. Oh, Mitch, I think your mic went away from us there. All right. Um, Trey, why don't you go ahead and get started? All right, thanks, sir. So uh, hello, everyone, and uh, happy holidays to you. Um, we're going to start the uh, webinar off as we uh, typically do. And uh, so this is a chart here um, of kind of what the indices have done year to date. Um, as we see the Dow Industrial uh, Average is down just over 5%. Uh, but that's that top green line um, on the bottom there. Uh, the uh, NASDAQ is um, down just over 27% for the year. Um, a little bit tougher go um, for the technology stocks due to inflation and high interest rates. And so uh, this webinar, uh, we're going to, uh, much as we have uh, over the previous months, talk about kind of where we are in that roadmap, uh, which we uh, refer to as the hope cycle. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of what inflation, uh, the most recent readings in inflation, and uh, what the Fed is doing in the face of that. Um, and then interestingly, interestingly enough, we're going to talk about some of the disparity uh, that's present in some of the employment reports um, so why that matters. So um, on the, uh, the next slide here, uh, we've kind of got just another snapshot uh, of um, performance there for various indices and our market portfolios. Um, kind of same theme we've had uh, all year, which is there's really no place to hide. Uh, bond markets are down. Stocks are down. Um, 60, 40 models are down. Um, it has been a tough year for investors. Uh, we're, in, we're about 12 months into it. Um, and so that's kind of uh, been the same story. Uh, if you'll look in the uh, quarter to date columns, you'll see some uh, some green numbers there. We've had a, a decent rally there coming off of uh, mid-October. Uh, we kind of set those expectations in our October webinar. Uh, that was due to seasonality. Uh, markets tend to rally at the end of the year uh, alongside some oversold conditions. Um, and so that's much of what we've seen. Uh, our view is that this, uh, this, re this rally uh, is uh, reaching maturity. Uh, it is growing long in the tooth, and it is uh, not too long uh, before it comes to a close. So we'll elaborate more on that as we kind of go through here. Um, so on the uh, the next slide there, I think, Mitch, um, if, if you're still with us here, I think you've got um, some slides here on ITR and the economy at a glance. Okay. I think Mitch, Mitch's mic is still not working that's okay um, i'll pick up here so um uh, this is itr uh, trends um and they're just trying to coincidentally kind of depict where different uh, measures of economic data is uh both currently and in the future and um so uh we can see along the bottom there in terms of the the color graphing that the phase keys yeah. so go ahead mitch <laughs> I think as soon as you're with us, it knows that and it uh, kicks in. But uh, okay, just uh, interrupt me uh, whenever whenever your mic comes back on. Um, but uh, as we see uh, this year, everything looks to be in a slowing growth there. Um, ITR uh, has a few spots uh, next year that will uh, go back to accelerating growth, um, and so um, that that is uh, kind of what they're seeing at this moment. And then 2024. Uh, uh, they would have uh, most of these data points back into accelerating growth. Um, we'll kind of share my uh, opinion, which may differ a little bit there as we go through. But this is kind of uh, the way they illustrate it in terms of, uh, I think, what they refer to as kind of the roller coaster. Uh, so different uh, important data points that they follow there. Uh, most of them are, like we said, in that uh, slowing growth phase there. Um, most of them are kind of at an indecision point between a soft landing, hard landing. 
Um, only uh, financial and I guess housing at this point is kind of diverging to that hard landing. Uh, I tend to agree with that. Um, so that's just a nice illustration uh, in terms of where everything is at there for, uh, for the ITR stuff. Um, here's our hope cycle. Um, and again, uh, hope uh, starts with kind of the leading indicators of the economy um, and, and ends with the lagging indicators of the economy. And it's meant to illustrate uh, the way that um, the changes in monetary policy um, affect different sectors at different times. Um, so housing, new orders, profits, and employment is that acronym there. So um, uh, as we illustrated last month, which was new to that webinar, um, profits, uh, corporate profits, uh, we have a great deal of confidence now that the weakness that has been present in housing at the beginning of this year uh, is now uh, present in corporate profits. We'll kind of uh, help illustrate that again uh, as we go through the slides here. Um, but uh, and then a couple of new developments with employment that we'll touch on as well. Um, so that's kind of where we think we are in this cycle. Um, going forward here, we'll kind of jump into that hope cycle. Uh, so housing, this is our NAHB housing market index. Um, and so this is a, a, builder, uh, a builder sentiment survey uh, for homes here in the United States. Um, and um, what we see here, what we got in, in November was a reading of 33. Uh, readings below 50 are uh, definitely contractionary um, in, in, in nature. And so uh, that reading of 33 came in below forecasts of 36, and it marked the 11th straight month of declines. Um, so um, what we've got here uh, is a comment from the uh, the chairman there of the NAHB, which kind of succinctly wraps up what's kind of in uh, what's affecting housing at this moment, which we should all be familiar with by now. Uh, higher interest rates have significantly weakened demand for new homes as buyer traffic has become increasingly scarce. So high interest rates, uh, mortgage rates, you know, um, for a great deal of this year have been uh, above six percent, and at some points um, at around seven percent. Um, that is choking off demand in the housing sector. Um, and so we're continuing to see weakness there. Uh, we've been seeing that all uh, all year. This is another measure of the housing, uh, housing data that we follow, building permits. It's a proxy for future construction of housing. And um, most recent um, reading came in at one, just over 1.5 million uh, permits filed in October. We'll get a new report out in a couple of days. Uh, it is forecasted to be lower, uh, below one and a half uh, million. And um, uh, the most recent reading even came in below estimates. Um, and so we're seeing that weakness that usually portends recession, weak economic activity. Um, that's been something we've been um, very upfront about in housing uh, all year. So uh, moving from housing to the O acronym uh, of uh, new orders, uh, we split it between manufacturing and services. This is the manufacturing portion. Uh, most recent reading came in at um, 47.2. Uh, for November, that was two points lower uh, than October. Uh, current reading is tied with basically the uh, the low for this second uh, for this business cycle, um, and um, so we're getting to a point where uh, you know moves below this uh, level start to give you a, a, an incredibly high probability of recessions, uh, almost uh, 100%. Um, and um, so the most recent reading. Um, came in uh, again at 47.2. It, it was the third straight month of falling new orders. Any reading below 50 is contractionary. Um, so here, um, this is the services portion of that new orders index. Um, and so purchasing managers in the services sector are um, doing a bit better. Uh, we would expect to see this start to contract below 50 at, at the onset of the recession. Currently at 56, it is not in contractionary territory for the services. Uh, it tends to lag the manufacturing just because of the supply chain process. Um, so 50, um, 56 was the most recent reading, only down half a point uh, from October. So um, on the next one here, we kind of transitioned to profits. This was the, um, uh, the, the big change in uh, last month's webinar. Uh, where we kind of, uh, with a great deal of confidence, uh, moved our targets to profits in terms of weakness that has transcended uh, from the beginning of year housing into profits. So what we have here is just current year earnings per share for the S&P 500. Uh, we've got a, a, a pink line on there uh, just to tr try to smooth out some of that data. Uh, that's that 12-month moving average. Uh, profits right now are below average. Um, and uh, moves below that level generally start to portend a recession. Um, we um, currently, right now, for 2022, earnings are expected to rise about 4.8%. So um, not yet contracting. 
Um, and on the next slide here, we will take a look at next year's estimated earnings for the S&P 500. Uh, moving down all year, um, and moving down since the summer, uh, flat since the beginning of this year, about April or so. Um, so next year's earnings, oddly enough, are still marked about 6.9% growth. Um, I will offer my own opinion, and I will say that that is too optimistic. Uh, I think that there will be revisions down. I think that earnings next year will be negative. Um, we think um, that this, this uh, earnings rise lacks a fundamental basis. Um, and uh, as earnings estimates come down next year, they will weigh on stocks. Uh, so uh, profits being beat up there. Um, this is uh, the uh, the last letter of the acronym employment. Um, uh, we added a, a data point here uh, this month, and that's that black line. That's that continuing claims. So the first thing we start out with employment is the initial claims for unemployment. We start we, we split it by initial claims and then um, claimants that have been continuing their claims uh, for unemployment. And so that's that black line. We added that this month. Um, and it has started to rise, uh, which is usually what happens right before recessions. Um, now, it is the only data point, uh, really, that is starting to rise for employment. There is a disparity that we'll talk about in just a second. But this um, rise in continuing claims, that, that's been rising for eight months, or for, excuse me, eight straight weeks. Um, and over the, just over two months, we've added over 300 would-be workers uh, that are to this continuing claims um, uh, cohort. Um, so there is some weakness, at least in a, at a very beginning stage, uh, starting to maybe emerge in the uh, unemployment uh, portion there. Um, and so that's what we keep an eye on. And then the second data point we look at for unemployment, at least for the hope cycle, is going to be this unemployment figure here on the next slide. Um, and so this is uh, this is still hanging in around 3.7. It's been bouncing around between 3.5% and 3.7% unemployment all year. Um, and uh, what we've kind of seen is a, a, a trough in this data point. And um, uh, before it can rise, it must trough. And so we, we think we're building some confidence here that unemployment has kind of hit a four. And the next move would be up. Um, and so um, at this point, though, it has not moved up. Um, our, our view, uh, as we kind of um, you know, wrap the hope slide, uh, hope slide up, um, our view is that unemployment within the next you know, uh, you know, quarter will uh, start to come up a bit. Um, we, uh, we see that in the data. Uh, we see that in the, uh, the forecasting. Uh, the Fed sees it. They raised their target today for unemployment to about 4.6%. That's where they think it'll be next year. Um, and so we see unemployment starting to come up in the next coming months uh, in a recession. Uh, to follow that uh, in, in the few months after that. Um, so um, kind of staying on employment here, there's a disparity that's uh, occurring in the employment reporting. And um, there are uh, two different uh, two different ways that they uh, report employment. And they do that at the governmental level. Uh, and then they do that in the kind of the private enterprise level. Uh, so private companies and then governments uh, both have their own reporting. And uh, there's a disparity uh, in the way that the, the government is reporting jobs. We'll touch on that in a second. But here on this chart, we have the U.S. labor force change since March of this year. And we have the U.S. non-farm payrolls. So people being added to payrolls since March. And the um, uh, U.S. labor force is basically unchanged since March of this year. But there's been an almost 2% rise um, in people being added to the payrolls. Uh, um, and so the, the uh, discrepancy here is the non-farm payrolls, they, um, they report uh, part-time workers. And so if you are a factory worker and now you're Ubering at night, uh, they count that as a, an incremental job being added to the payrolls. Um, that is important to know. Um, but what is also important to know is um, the amount of incremental full-time workers uh, because those are more durable jobs um, and so uh, there's a bit of a discrepancy in um, some of the employment reporting especially what we see in the headlines when we read in the papers um, so that is important for us to know because uh, uh, the household survey which we'll see on the next slide as we contrast that to the non-farm payrolls uh, the household survey tends to be more accurate at, at big points and pivots uh, in the cycle and so that household survey, 12,000 jobs added since March of this year, uh, very little, almost none, uh, versus the almost 2.7 million that have been added to the establishment survey. That's that non-farm payroll report. So most of the jobs that have been added this year have actually just been part-time workers taking on more jobs, um, which is an important data point, as we said, uh, but it does not tell the full story. And we think that that's important to note. 
So uh, this next slide here, we have a, a new assistant PM. Uh, his name is Nick, and uh, he put helped put together together this slide here. And so we've talked uh, through this year about you know excess savings, uh, cash on the sidelines. Um, and so looking at that figure, uh, it peaked mid last year uh, at about 2.3 trillion uh, in excess savings. That's been quickly eroding. It's down to about 1.7 trillion now. Um, it, it's it's classically been about one one and a half trillion uh, over previous cycles. And so it's coming down and that's what inflation does. People are having to spend more money just to keep up with their uh, standard of life from last year. Um, and so um, the other unfortunate part of this is households are taking on more credit card debt. Um, so households have been adding about 130 billion of credit card debt, financing around 22% revolving, um, nearly double what they took in last year. Um, so not only are they burning through their uh, cash on the sidelines, uh, they're starting to, to uh, take on some credit to, uh, to survive. Um, it's very unfortunate. So that personal savings rate that we've referenced uh, peaked at 33% uh, the depth of the pandemic and has uh, come down to a record low of about 3.1%. So not much savings going on right there. People, um, uh, you really can't save when uh, your surplus earnings are going towards just um, keeping up with uh, grocery bills, housing, stuff like that. That's, that's just been so high this year. So additional concerns, um, it's okay, we can stick on this slide. Uh, the, the last point on that previous slide was um, that the, the average work week has come down a little bit uh, by about 30 basis points or 0.3%. Uh, when you do the math, that's equivalent to about 380,000 jobs, uh, kind of in the total uh, labor force there. Um, and that's happened over uh, the, the previous uh, reporting cycle. Um, so um, uh, again, going back to that point, more full-time workers, we're not really getting them, we're actually starting to lose them. Um, so on that next slide there that, uh, that Mitch had is looking at, this is the coincidental indicators. So this is just, it's, um, this is one chart, it's at two different time frames. We, um, we track uh, a, a whole litany of, of, of economic data, uh, both leading, coincidental, and lagging. And this is that coincidental portion. So this indicator will turn negative as we enter recession, and it will turn positive as we uh, emerge from recession. So I know there's been a lot of debate this year about whether we have or have not been a recession. Um, that's uh, that, that chart that we're looking at on the top left quadrant there, uh, top left portion, that's going back to 1967. Uh, that shaded, all those shaded regions are recessions. So those steep drops that you see in that blue line start to uh, coincide with a contracting figure uh, once we enter that recession there. Um, that bottom right portion is uh, just the previous two years, so we can just kind of zoom in on that. And that is um, where we are currently. So we had a little wobble this year where it did go and contract uh, just nominally. We've kind of bounced back up to a, you know, a positive reading of you know, 2 or 3%. Um, and so uh, I know it's been a contentious debate. Uh, I, I assure you um, in undergrad and CFA and all these other professional programs, they teach you that two quarters of uh, consecutive uh, declining real GDP is classified as a recession. We did have that this year. Um, uh, there were there were some nuance uh, that was going on with those reporting that kind of helped explain that. Um, but right now, uh, it's important for us to know that we are not in a recession. We do think we are going to get a recession, and we think we are not too far off from one. Uh, but we have not had one yet. And so since we haven't had a recession, we can't quite start uh, facing in a recovery, at least not yet. Yeah, so, Trey, uh, Trey, do you think we'll have the recession first, second, or third quarter in 23? So I think at the earliest, the recession could start first quarter of next year. I think uh, latest would probably be next um, uh, next Q3. Um, so that would put us somewhere between June and September uh, of, of a recession starting. Um, and so what we look at when we look at leading indicators, those are important for us as investors. Those leading indicators start to sour as stocks start to sour and they start to improve as stocks start to improve. Uh, stocks are actually a leading indicator. And um, the NAHB that we started our hope cycle with, uh, when we go and look back, um, you know, over 50 years or so uh, from, from the peak reading of that NAHB uh, into the point where unemployment starts to ascend, uh, we, we get readings somewhere between 24 months and 34 months. Um, the readings uh, we've gotten, they're mostly concentrated around 24 to 25 months. And um, that's most salient when uh, we've seen big, nasty drops in that NAHB uh, reading, that H of the hope cycle, which we are seeing. So I tend to think um, that we're going to be somewhere closer to that 24, 24, uh, excuse me, 24, 25 month period. That indicator peaked in November of 2020. And so theoretically, we are in the zone 
to where in the next few months, unemployment should start to spike. Um, it will take a few months uh, after that until a recession officially starts. Um, but um, uh, again, to, to answer Mitch's point, uh, do one. So that would put us somewhere between January and September of next year before we are in a recession. And I think it's a high, yeah. high degree of probability. And I think the important part is we, we talked about this in, in the last couple of webinars, um, the markets, the stock and the bottom market. Uh -oh. We lost you again. Yeah, I think um, I, I, we'll, we'll try to get Mitch back. But I think what he was trying to say is there's some. Um, uh, bond markets and stock markets uh, arrive uh, at different conclusions at different points in time. The bond markets, um, they're also looking at inflation and growth and cycles. And um, the bond market tends to, uh, we kind of say that the bond market's probably um, a little smarter than the stock market guys. Um, and so bond markets, uh, as yields have kind of uh, come down uh, over the past few months, maybe looking at, uh, you know, they've got a balance of scales to where on one hand they're worried about inflation. Uh, and the, on the other hand, they're worried about growth. And so I think we've seen the baton handed from uh, concerns about inflation being primary to the bond market to where now I think it's primarily concerned about growth. And um, so even um, as, as, as stocks have kind of um, you know, fallen a little bit over the past week or two, we've seen rates continue to go down, uh, which is um, that is different than what has been uh, uh, what we've seen this year. So we think that uh, the bond market's starting to figure out uh, how close we are to that recession. And um, with a great deal of confidence that inflation, inflation is behind us. That's kind of what we're looking at here on this slide. Um, so we got some readings of uh, inflation uh, just yesterday uh, for the month of November. And that came in at, uh, at the headline portion at 7.1% and at the core portion at 6.0%. Um, so this chart here, uh, it's just uh, breaking down some of the broad categories and components of inflation to give you an idea of what's contracting what's accelerating etc so that bottom portion there in the dark blue uh that's gonna that's what we classify as the sticky inflation so that's that services type of inflation um and that is the portion that is still accelerating uh is forecasted to con continue to accelerate and can be very difficult to bring down um and so that's why we'll talk about in a second what kind of what the fed is trying to do with that uh but you know, oils come down, gas prices have come down. That's that top salmon color there, salmon, salmon color at the top there. Uh, that it, that is collapsing. Uh, it is it's it's taking away from some of that uh, big pop in inflation we had some of this year. Um, but uh, the job for uh, squashing inflation is not done yet. And so that's kind of what we see here on the next slide uh, when we look at the market interest rate projections. So this is a way that the markets try and price in uh, to what level. Uh, the Federal Reserve will hike rates um, and the um, the coinciding times at, at which they'll hike them there, uh, hold them there and cut them. And so that's what we're seeing. That blue, uh, those blue squares, that's the path of interest rates here. What it's saying is we're currently, they hiked them today to about uh, four and a half percent, but they're going to go to four and a half percent at the top level. Uh, uh, then they're going to increase them uh, to five percent through March of next year. And they're just going to hold rates there. Uh, they've kind of been consistent in that messaging. They're going to hold rates at that restrictive level, basically until something breaks. Um, because um, without saying it, they're they're going to cause a recession. Um, and recessions do a great job of um, of squashing inflation. That's just what happens. So um, they're going to hold them there. Uh, the market is expecting them to start cutting rates in September of next year um, and start easing that cycle. Um, it's not good news uh, when when the Fed is cutting rates. It's because growth is falling off a cliff, um, and um, the the tightening that they put in this year it's a lagged effect. So um, that's why we continue to be defensive, as, as Mitch was alluding to earlier. Um, when we um, when we when we look at it, twenty twenty three next year is going to be about falling earnings and unemployment rising. Uh, both are very negative for stock markets. We think bonds will probably do well. We're working on some. Uh, reallocation in some of our passive models. Um, stocks will weigh under that. Um, the uh, stocks will have another uh, bad year, at least for the portion of next year. Um, there is uh, still, there is actually a good deal of probability that um, that we will start to find the bottom in markets next year. Uh, that is a, kind of a moving target. Uh, the question that 
I know it gets asked a lot is kind of when is this going to be over? Um, my answer is I don't know when it will be over, but I know what we are looking at to see that it is over. Um, and um, the, the leading indicators that we follow, um, there are dozens of them, and they are just not positive yet. And when they are, we will be prompt at letting you know. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the 2023 brief outlook. Uh, Nick also put together this slide here. Um, this is uh, COVID uh, cases in China. We have not talked about COVID for a while, uh, which I think is a, a very good thing. Um, unfortunately, it is uh, becoming a problem in China again. And they have historically had a, a zero COVID policy. Yeah, Trey, um, I think my mic's working again. Again, everyone, I apologize. Go to meeting, change their software yesterday. They didn't tell us. And for some reason, my mics are not working properly. They're very inconsistent. Um, this slide here, China has not dealt with COVID well. Um, the information about China is very untruthful. Um, only 40% of their elderly population has been vaccinated with a Chinese vaccine, which is not very good. Um, some reports in, there, in the Economist uh, title article this week, it's called China's COVID Failure. They're predicting the economists somewhere between 680,000 people and maybe as many as 4 million Chinese are going to die over the next few months. It's primarily because they don't have the ICU, the medical care. Their vaccines are crap. <clears throat> they prohibit the importation of the Western uh, vaccines. And with the factories uh, in China, so much of it, uh, the world's production comes out of China, it's going to be negatively impacted. So I think we're anticipating another supply chain interruption in the first part of the year as this Omicron variant spreads to the population, although it's not. I think we lost you there, Mitch. Maybe, maybe we can get you back here real quick. Yeah. So um, again, there's um, there's just uh, it's a, a reoccurrence of uh, COVID chase, uh, COVID cases in China. Something to watch uh, in terms of the global supply and demand. Um, they are an important player both in uh, the demand and supply uh, because a lot of uh, the world's manufacturing is done in China. So uh, that was the uh, the important uh, note there. Um, so um, here we have uh, capitulation signals. Uh, there is a litany of data points we look at to see whether technically the market has uh, reached an event in which we call capitulation in investing, where there is in mass selling, uh, and it's usually done uh, with zero discretion. Um, and it's uh, usually a, a peak point in panic of markets. So these are four points that we look at volatility, volume, breadth, and sentiment. Um, none of these indicators uh, have given us any confidence that any of those triggers um, have been triggered. So um, at this point, both fundamentally and technically, we're still seeing some weakness here. Uh, there will be some optimism. It is just not here yet. So, Yeah, um, and, and I think, Trey, the, the bond market, and we talked about this last month, is becoming more attractive. A number of you on this call and other clients have uh, allocated some money to bonds. So those of you that have lower risk tolerances or have money in cash, now's a good time to deploy it. For those of you in more risky portfolios who are waiting for a market rebound and then reallocate the bonds because even after the markets re rebound, the bond market still will be attractive as an entry point. We haven't had an entry point this good for bonds in over 20 years. So that, that if there is some silver lining, we, we do see that in the bond market. Yeah. And um, I guess if I, I could elaborate, um, it, all this year, it's been really tough to be a bond investor and a stock investor because inflation is just the wrench in all engines. Um, and um, that has changed now. Bond markets, again, we, we, we've illustrated this in previous webinars. They're worried about inflation. We're also worried about growth. Uh, we think primarily they're worried about growth now. And so what we see in a normal bear market is bonds rally and yields drop. That's what we're starting to see now. And so Fluent Financial has been uh, classically underweight bonds uh, for many years for good reason, because they did not pay anything in the equity risk premiums we got as being a stock investor more than compensated um, that, that it, reallocation. So now what we're doing in some of those passive models is realigning them to where they can uh, benefit from some of that uh, higher.
or yield that has finally uh, presented itself in the fixed income market. Um, that is a, an ongoing project. You'll, you'll start to see that. We'll start to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we, we think the next stage of, of, of stock market weakness will be alongside bond market strength. And um, so we're, we're trying to make sure we're positioned uh, for that event. So um, as we wrap up pretty much every uh, webinar here, we wrap up with this cash is king slide, uh, which just depicts uh, the cash generation that we have uh, for some of our models, ADV, ADVP, and stock income, uh, the targets that we aim for, and the trailing 12 months of cash generation for them. So um, if you have any questions about this, or you have any friends that would like help um, turning their retirement into a paycheck, uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. So. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to open this here to any questions, answers. Um, it's been a long and tough year. Uh, if anyone has any questions about this year or questions about what we should uh, anticipate for next year that we didn't already elaborate on, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat box there. Uh, and we will give some time here uh, to get those responses in. Um, yeah.